I'm here with Dale, uh, Dale the Snailwood, uh, former ISK Super Middleweight Champion of the World. But before we start, I want to know about the man behind the mollusk. Do you like that? You gotta like that. Where's that name come from, Dale? Uh, when I was at school, I was um, not the most confident, a bit quiet. Uh, not overly bullied, but I was bullied. Um, and one of the names that came up a lot through sort of primary school was, was Dale the Snail, right? Right. Yeah, you laugh. It's Charles, right? But we were children. Uh, and I hated it, absolutely hated it. And it was just something that cropped up and I hated it. And then when I had my first fight, <coughs> um, first couple of fights, but first title fight was on a poster, and Doug was on my life, I've made a nickname. And you, know, you look around at the you know, Iron Mike Tyson, all these. Yeah. It's, it wasn't me, it's not what I wanted. So I said snail as a, thinking it'd be a one-off, just worth throwing it back. So if anybody who called it me as a derogatory comment back in the day, and read it and be like, uh, yeah. It was probably the most asked thing that I was asked when we were looking after you, when you were <laughs> fighting out of our gym. It's like the snail, what's the snail? Is he slow or? I actually had a guy in a pub when I worked on the door, were about to kick off with me because I had a shit name. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it's only it sort of, so, but then it became a fun thing. Some of them I hated, and then it was a fun. You know, I've got like, uh, tattoos and you know, snail tattoos and that. So, and it, so and some and bully, so some bully at school can take credit for that. If I remember it, is they're, they're in trouble. Oh wow. Uh, okay, so let's rewind it back. Okay, before the snail, before school, your childhood. What kind of childhood did you have, and good? What can you remember about it? I had a good childhood. Happy with three brothers. Um, we're all close. So yeah, I had a good childhood. Um, I was quiet, shy, um, a bit of a boy, I suppose. Um, nothing, nothing out of this world. Were you sporty? Yeah, yeah, always sporty, football, rugby, athletics. That was the reason I started kickboxing. Um, yeah, yeah, very sporty. But I used to knock about with sort of the quieter kids at school. And like when I was at secondary school, it was a, um, I, I tended to get on with the quieter, not so popular kids. Mm -hmm. Um, that probably did get bullied, but it was sport that stopped me getting bullied. So I was knocking about the kids that got bullied, um, not like massively bullied, you know, but they're not so popular. And, and because I was in the you know, sort of like the rugby team and the athletic squad and what have you, I got left alone. Okay, so that was my that was my like, saving grace at school. And and before your martial arts, could you go? Could you go in a fight if you needed to? <sighs> I've got long fuse. There's, there's one kid in particular that that tormented me as a, as a kid. Um, and I remember walking down this country lane, because I'm from the country, um, with my older brother. And this kid's walking up the road. And um, he didn't do anything, bless him. But he, he tormented me, he was like really nasty tormented me. Um, and for a kid of that age to mentally torment someone as well, it wasn't a nice kid. And he's walking towards me and I start going into a panic. Uh, and I'm like, oh, it's gonna go, it's gonna go. And my brother turned around. And at the time, I didn't appreciate it, but looking back, I do now. And he was like, deal with it. And this kid got within like two foot, never said a word, never looked at me, nothing. And, and I just fled to him, <laughs> drove him to a dry stone wall and beat him up. And it, was, it wasn't a case of a fight, it was because I just had enough. And, and how old were and you? Snapped. 12, 12, and snapped. 12. Would, about 12 years old. Would you say that that was your first fight? Yeah, I said so. Because you country boys don't fight a lot, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, from my third, yeah. I mean, even, even brothers though, we didn't really fight between each other, to be fair. Good relationship with like Ricky. Ricky, yeah, Ricky um, is the youngest one. Um, I mean, I love more to bits, all the same. Me and Ricky are probably a little bit closer because we share the kickboxing team four as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and he's really sporty. I mean, he's an exceptional runner, exceptional runner. Um, so yeah, we, we probably, yeah, we've done more together because we've got a shared interest with the sport, I suppose, yeah. So martial arts then, how did that come about? What age and um, how think, did you get into oh, it? 14, I think 14 everyone's got an interest in martial arts. You know, every, every boy's got an interest in, in fighting with some form or other. But I did counter level uh, hurdles, uh, athletics. And it was uh, to get flexible, which 30 years later I still ain't flexible. <laughs> <laughs> so I picked the wrong martial art. But um, yeah, part of it was to get flexible, part of it was just an interest in kickboxing. Did you get into it off your own back or did yeah, like, you run for it? Yeah, there was an advert in the local paper. Um, Doug Harrison opened the Derbyshire Panthers under Ecker at the local sports centre. They had an open day where you could just come along and talk. And I went along and watched it and I thought, yeah, I love this. 
and then I was going to start the week after, but I dropped the paving slab on my toe, so I had to wait another week for a start. But well, you look at a lot of world champions, like people that go right to the top of the sport, and they they tend to be into it from a very young young age, like five, six, seven years old. You got into it at fourteen. Do you think 14. that's that's quite quite late? It is, but I was busy early doors. I mean, I started fourteen just before I turned in the February. Is that ten fifteen in the May? And then after a year, I was fifteen, coming up for sixteen, and I'm my first full contact fight. So I've been training a year. And then from that point, for the next three years, I fought every every six weeks for three so, years. So did you have, there was no tournament circuit for you, you were straight into full contact? Wacko, Wacko had some mat stuff, but it wasn't really. My first fight was 10 ounce gloves, full contact. I mean, I was 15, I think we said I was 16. I was 15, uh, he was 27. Wow. My first six fights, I was 15 turned 16. And my first six fights, so yeah, first six fights, I went and beat him. And there was nobody moving 21. Wow. And then I lost my first fight because of my mum. <laughs> because of your mum? Because of my mum. Okay, how did that come about? Because I'm coming back from these fights and I'm winning, but obviously you get your scuff and black eyes happens. My mum didn't like that. So she took my instructor to one side behind my back and complained that Dale, Dale's getting black eyes. And Dougie's like, well, Dale's winning. So I'm not happy. He's fighting full grown men. So I got matched against a 16 year old, uh, Dale O'Brien from Barnsley. So my third, my sixth. Six, seven, five, I think it was. Uh, for somebody my own age and lost. No way. <laughs> yeah. I think when, when you're coming up against like these older guys that like 26, 27, and they've probably got other things going in in their life, they're probably training like once or twice a week. Whereas yeah. when you're, you're all in, when you're 15, 16, aren't you? Every yeah, you've day you've got a natural fit. The only thing you've not got is probably that like man strength, mm -hmm. but you've got the tenacity and, and everything else. It's just then leaps and bounds. So yeah, I think that's what carried me through that. And you say that like by nature you're very placid and you've got a long yeah. fuse. So when, when it goes, it goes. But it rarely goes. When you started competing, especially in a full contact, mm -hmm. did you feel like you had to have a switch, or did you fight, feel did it feel natural to you to turn it on when you needed to turn it on? I had to wind myself up. I had to wind myself up in the changing rooms. Uh, and then I'd walk out, and if you go any male fight videos, whatever, I'm walking out during it's that's it. I've switched on. Uh, nothing else matters, I've switched on. Um, and that's, that's it. Because it's, it's not. Because if you lose it, you've lost it, haven't you? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. If you're not in control of it, it's controlled aggression. It, it, you know, it's controlled aggression. And if you lose it, you see a lot of fighters get pumped up and lose it. And they're burning energy. And they're burning energy, they're not thinking straight, and they're, they're, they're relying on the back of the brain. They're not. Um, well, it's, it's, it's like I love, I love, I love the brain, obviously. But um, like the work I do through the gym and through my professional life, I like looking into the brain. And um, there's a book called uh, The Chimp Paradox, I think it is, and it's brilliant. It's like the, the brain explains the idiots, which is why I got the book. And it basically calls the back of the brain, the oldest part of the brain, is like your chimp, and that reacts to everything. And then the front, the different parts, but the front of your brain is your computer. And life is about training the computer to override the chimp and, and get things done properly. Now and again, you need the chimp, don't get me wrong. You know, that's, that's your caveman, that's mm -hmm. caveman reactions. But you need to control that. And if you don't control that, if the fight doesn't control that, they make mistakes again on town. And did you feel, did you always feel, because anyone that knows you knows you're a nice guy, like you, you're a super nice guy, you're one of the, the genuine salt of the earth kind of guys from the sport. Um, sometimes, nice guys come in last especially in competition especially in like contact sports you see a lot of contact sports especially like the MMA I, I, had, the this, I had this conversation um, with, with uh, a coach recently actually we were talking about a fighter that lost a fight that shouldn't have lost a fight um, and it was the makeup of the fight really what, what did it um, and we, we talked about this particular fight and you can be as nice as you like but every fighter at some point has got to be the C word yeah, yeah. You've got to be able to just do it. You've got to want to inflict pain. You've got to want to knock somebody out. Wanting to win is not enough. You need. That's why a lot of kids that come in the gym, they've got character, they've been misbehaving, and what have you. It's like, that's, that's, that's nice. You can, you can channel that. Um, and sometimes, you know, to be a good fighter, no matter how nice you are, you've got to be the C word. You've just got to be able to and do it. And knock them out, finish it. You, you've got to switch that. And. Um, yeah, I do think I'm a nice person, I'm not an idiot or whatever, but um, if need be, I will be 
the C word. And you had no problem knocking people no, out? Not at all, not at all. So that initial thing when you'd hit somebody and they'd hit the floor, is it more about jubilance of you winning or fear for their safety? Yeah, I'm very competitive, very competitive. And it's, it's so yeah, if I knock them out, don't get me wrong, it's, I've, I've, you know, I've, got, I've got aggressive and I've wanted, to, I've wanted to knock them out. But on the win, it's because I want to win. Yeah, yeah. And if you knock them out, you won't. So okay, the okay. fight you've knocked them out, all of a sudden becomes just secondary. I, I would imagine there's very few fighters that can get to that top, top level without having that killer instinct. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But, yeah. It, it, but it's about knowing the right time, isn't it? You see some fighters, especially in the MMA world and in the boxing world, and they carry their ring persona over into real life. Yeah. You know, the, the Adrian Broners of the world and you know, you, you were never like that, that kind of guy, were yeah. you? No, 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 I'm not, no, no. Respect, respect, I'm big on respect, respect's a big thing. Um, it's, it's like, um, oh, who's the, uh, the boxer uh, recently, Ukrainian. Come on, help me out. Lama, Lamachenko. Yeah, Lamachenko. Uh, when he was calling the corner man to stop it and throw the towel. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, there was the, is it uh, Rogan, the heavyweight, the Irish heavyweight? Yeah, yeah. And he lost the fight because of that. Yeah, yeah. He, he was trying to, um, he, he said to the referee, you've got to stop it, and the referee didn't stop it. And then he, I think he lost that fight, didn't he? It was a yeah. Commonwealth. Does, I mean, there's, there's people question why he did that. Was he doing that to, to make him look? Like so far superior that he, like he can he can play the part of the referee as well. Yeah. And and to be fairness to, to if, in fairness to his opponent Richard Comey, I mean he did weather the storm and he did go the distance. So yeah. Do you never done that to any of your opponents? Uh, Waved no. in the referee. No 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 no. no. Too busy trying not to get it myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've had conversations with my opponents, but um, no, I've never tried to get to stop with the referee. Okay, back to your fighting. So we've gone six fights in, six, seven fights in, you've had your first loss. How did that loss affect you? I barely remember it. Um, I was, because like, like I say, the first six years after my first fight, um, I didn't realise it's recently when I was looking at a record, um, that yet on average every six weeks, full contact fight every week, six, six weeks for three years. Um, and it was just, it was just another day. And I think nowadays, fighters don't fight enough. Yeah. For it to be like that, I mean, if you go to Thailand and see the ties, they, you know, their records like 300, 300 fights. That's what they do. That's why they don't spar heavy. You know, they, they don't wear shin pads when they spar because they don't need heavy sparring. Yeah. So it's it just becomes it's just another thing. You know, loads of sparring, loads of fights, and if you lose, you lose. And I'm glad I lost then, and not later in my career, because I think it would have got harder and harder and harder to lose. Yeah. And and I think so. Yeah, it's just a lesson. I mean. I've got 60 fights, 13 losses, and I think I learned more from those 13 losses than any of the other. And, and around that six, seven fight mark, well, when you started your fighting career, was the was it I'm going all the way in the sport, or I want to go all the way in the sport, or was it just seeing how it was going? Right away, it wasn't a case of how far I wanted to go. I mean, to me, middle area titles the world back then, um, but it was I got addicted. That first fight, as soon as the final bell went, I remember walking over to the corner to Doug, I didn't care if I'd been or lost. And I just asked him what the next one was. <laughs> that was it for me. That was that just the adrenaline of it, the lift the crowd, the fight, everything. It was just that was addictive. It's, it's that. something that you, you can't explain to people that haven't been there. No. They'll never get it. No, no. Or how, how hard three rounds is. Yeah, yeah. I, I love the look of a new fighter when they have their first fight. They come back on the stool after the first round. They sit down. How do you feel? It's yeah, the because they're, they're banging out like twelve rounds in the gym, no bother at all. <clears throat> no. And as soon as they get under the lights, the nervous energy hits them. Yeah, yeah. We had, we had a, a guy did it for charity at a, a kickboxing fight for charity. Um, uh, Dave Aslam, one of the local lads in Matlock, and, and he came to him from rugby club. He was a tough lad. He played rugby, and um, and he wanted one fight from scratch to a fight. It was before the white collar sort of days. Yeah. And we wanted to go from nothing to a full contact fight for charity. So we did it. Um, tough lad. And he was fit, fit, naturally fit. And he'd be dancing around, yeah, we'll do this, we'll do that. And I think, oh. and after the first <laughs> round, I couldn't wait for the first round. And he got in, he sat down after the first round, I was like, how did you feel? And his face just said it all. He was just, now you realise how hard it is. And, but he, he put in the time, he put in the time. Uh, and he did really well. But yeah, it's that look on the face. It's I think like, that only goes away after you've had X amount of fights and you, you learn to control the nervous energy and use it as you know fuel rather than a, 
letting it burn you up. Yeah, this is it. But the more experience you get, it's like if someone said to me, now you have to get back in the ring. Do you have three rounds, five rounds, or 12 rounds? I'll have 12. Yeah. I'll have 12. <laughs> yeah. It's not that, about the rounds, it's about the pace. Yeah, of course. So when you started off in your career, who was your um, inspirations around that time? Like who did you know about fight wise? And um, who were you emulate, emulating and, you know, well, I, I started, trying to be like? As I said, I started with Eka. The Derbysh Panthers with Eka. Was Dougie still fighting at the time? Yeah, he fought on a couple of the same cards as me. Yeah, he fought on the Barnsley show and on the Birmingham show. Wow. Yeah. Um, you are showing your age now. No disrespect, Doug, but... <laughs> <laughs> Silver Fox. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah. I think two shows I fought on the... Fought two, two shows that, that he, he fought on. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was Eka. So, uh, obviously, we were getting graded by Eka. We were looking up through Eka. So, uh, it was Cash Guilds, it was Hal Browns. And he, was, you know, he was a legend, still is. Um, so, yeah, they were, they were, they were initially right from the beginning. Um, I think Hal Brown... It was, it was at a show. Before I had my first fight, Dougie's dad took me over and introduced me to him. And I'm like, you know, yeah, starstruck. Yeah. And, he says, and this, to... and this, let, let's just rewind it, rewind it back. This is before like social media, Instagram, yeah. Facebook, YouTube. Yeah, yeah. This was like this was magazines. Yeah, magazines. yeah. It combat because it was in fighters, magazines. Yeah, yeah. yeah, martial arts illustrated and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that was it. So, you know, and he was in his grading as well. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. <laughs> so yeah, Arthur Lockwood, uh, another one. Um, and so yeah, to me he was a hero. So when I got introduced to him, uh, and he said, "Do you want to fight?" and I said, oh, "Yeah, yeah." And he actually said to me, "I wouldn't bother; it hurts." <laughs> and um, and then a few years later, they brought an American over. Uh, Howard Brown was coaching an American. And I got fighting. Yes, not seen, I've not seen Howard Brown since then. I was actually in. Were you in the corner? I was in the corner of Howard's guy that night. Yeah, because yeah. I won, and I went over and told Howard. I said, I told you I wanted to fight. Yeah. Like, yes, I, I remember that. that. Yeah, I remember that. What time I got out. Wow. So. Your career, I always talk to my fighters and say like, you know, if you want a career, you want it like Dale's in terms of winning everything stage by stage. You won area, English, three English, three English. Area defended it, three English, I think it was WKA, WKO, Woomer. Um, and then we had the British defended that, I think twice. Commonwealth defended that, European defended that, I think. I defended it twice, lost it the second time. Took a bit of time out, lost my head a little bit, uh, and then I came back and had three cracks at the world time. So was that something that was by design, or was that just the way it fell? Because you don't see fighters doing that. It's actually a bit It's not about winning. My, my one regret is not defending the world title, because the only one I didn't defend. So, but I wasn't in a position to defend it, and the sensible option was to retire. Um, but you should defend it. You, you win a title, but you secure it by defending it. Uh, yeah. And that, that's what makes you a champion, I think. If, you know, proper British champions defended it and then you move on. And in that era there was enough people to defend it. I always say because you were in the like the welterweight kind of light middleweight 69, people, 70, yeah, and the, the the crazy talent in that division, the, the Carl Drakes, the yeah, um, <laughs> the Franz, the Bertel Queelys, yeah. like I mean you could name 15 fighters there that were all like European to world class. Yeah, yeah it was a good division. A painful division, <laughs> and you and you managed to climb your way up the ranks. Who who did you beat along the way there? Like honourable mentions. Honourable mentions. Uh, I actually fight Carl Drake, but he beat me. Um, he beat me on points. Went down there and fought in his backyard. And he beat me on points. Uh, he's a good fighter. Uh, but I came out thinking I'd won it. Right. Um, I was told after the fight he won it, so I was convinced I'd won it. Um, I was in a bad mood after for years. Ever since then, I thought I was robbed that night. Right, because it was in it was in his own town, and, and it was sponsored by his family and all this. But yeah, everything was like I think I went to DJ or something. It was late too much, sort of ridiculous. <laughs> and, and I was convinced. Oh, I'm yeah. And then obviously Facebook comes along and you reconnect and what have you, and he's a top. Man. And um, and actually watched the fight for the first time over lockdown. He sent it, and I watched it for the first time. I had to message him. So yeah, he won that. Yeah, it's definitely one hundred percent. He won that. Wow. Yeah, one hundred percent. How many years after was that? Twenty odd years. Jeez. So yeah. Facebook, Facebook has got its um, yeah, its, yeah. its practicalities as well. Yeah, yeah. Strangers popping up with knockout videos, you get knocked unconscious. Yeah, yeah. You probably don't like want that. to see those. No, I don't mind. That. And you fought a lot of dis different disciplines as well: full contact, low kick, Thai. Yeah. Did you fight Thai? Yeah. K1. No, I didn't fight K1. I fought low kick. You didn't fight K1. I didn't fight K1. That's a shocker. Yeah. No, I didn't fight K1. I fought. Uh, obviously, full contact was what I started with. And that was, yeah, that was a 
bread and butter. Um, I fought in the ABAs, amateur boxing, had a handful of fights on amateur boxing. Um, and then I went up to Leeds, back company with Richard Smith. Um, and I was, I was actually a full contact fighter there, which was odd for bad company. Mm -hmm. but, you know, world's top Thai boxing gyms and idiot Aries trousers. <laughs> um, and every time I sparred with the lads there, you know, like, yeah, yeah kicks my waist, kicks my waist. You can see it look in the face like, oh. I bet you had a lot of banter down there. It's a brilliant gym. Yeah, yeah, brilliant gym. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fantastic gym, huh? uh, And it's like a conveyor belt for world champions. It's, it's a cracking gym. How did you fall, like, obviously you, you say your full contact was your bread and butter and that's where you were forging your career. How did you fall into the tie? Well, I left the Panthers, <laughs> let's say I started at 14, I left Panthers at 21, so I had seven years under Doug. Um, and then I left, it just, just, just gym politics. Um, uh, at 21, I think I was European champion at the time, and I, I just didn't need it. So I said I was taking time out, and if I was back, I was back. If I went, I weren't. And I'd met, when I fought in France, um, a year or so earlier, I'd met Richard Smith. Um, super bad company. <clears throat> I mean, now Richard's, Richard's had full contact fights, he's had boxing fights, you know, he's, he's not just tight, but that's what he excels in. And at the time, I think he'd got a full contact fight coming up. So after the French trip, he got back in touch and I went up and did some sparring with him for full contact, and, and that's obviously how we connected. So when I walked out of the gym, I rang him up and said, you know, could we make it full time? And he took me on as a full contact fight, which was bizarre. Um, and like I said, the sparring just developed. And he was like, let's have a crack at this low kick then. And then, yeah, loved it. Yeah, absolutely fell into it. Because Doug was anti low kick, anti tight, it was all above waist. Yeah, yeah. So we never even entertained it. So to go up there and spar it, you know, with the likes of Jordan Watson, Liam Harrison, Andy House, and Richard Cannon, and all them, it's just. And you're I mean, very. They were kids then. But. You're very qualified. Obviously, like, you got your tie boxing, or your tie boxers, should I say, that like frown and look down on other disciplines, and you got your full contact people, and they look down and frown on other disciplines. You're probably in the most one of the positions, the most qualified positions to speak about the differences between the styles and which was your personal favorite? I think I was lucky. I think, it, I mean, I picked, I, I picked the best coaches. I was lucky, like, I, I traveled for it. You know, and within Britain, you're not gonna get any better than back company. You're not gonna get better than Neil Kelly in full contact. So if you want full contact, you got Neil Kelly yourself. If you want tight boxing, you got Richard Smith. It's like a no brainer. So for me to be stuck between the two of you, you know, like an, an hour and 20 minutes, whatever, either way, it, it was perfect. So when did tie boxing, Richard, when did full contact, obviously came back down to you. Um, and I think that's why I love tie boxing, I love full contact. But for me, K1's that happy medium mm -hmm. in the middle. It's so like, was there a lot of K1 activity when you were at your peak? Not really, not really, no. no it was either tie boxing, there was low kick, there was some low mm -hmm. kick. I mean, sometimes I'd wear daft boots, shorts and boots. And, yeah, where yeah. I was coming from. Um, but I think for me, for me and my personal taste, everyone's different. Um, I like the fluidity of the footwork of, of full contact. I like the, the brutal side of Thai boxing. A lot of people don't like Thai boxing because of the clinch, but it's because they don't understand the clinch. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of it is because they don't understand the clinch. It's like a lot of people don't like MMA because it's cuddling. Yeah, understand it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 fight. yeah. So, um, but for me, it's K1, so you, 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 you've got that tie boxing edge and you've got the full contact, so it's a map of K1. Did you feel like the tie boxing helped you in your full contact fight and vice versa? Yeah, it's body kicks in particular. It, it sort of, I've never been a fancy kicker anyway. So it, 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 it yeah, the, the, the round kicks, but strength around the round kicks. Richard's a brilliant boxing coach as well anyway, mm -hmm. so it helped with my hands. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think it did help. I mean, it was strange fighting the world, first world title at full contact with a, with a corner with you know, Liam Harris and Richard Smith in your corner. At the time it didn't seem weird. But yeah. You look back now and see the difference. Um, I've, I, I've seen a, a picture not so long back on Facebook where you put up and like they're in your corner and I assume that was like a K1 or a tie fight. No. That was your first? No, that was that was Frank first time. No. Okay, so that brings us on to your world titles. So you've, you've fought for all the titles going through the levels mm -hmm. right the way up to world titles. How did the world title against Fran come about? I was, um, I'd not had a big break. I didn't really have much of a break at all, but I started, I started getting into the, in the early 20s, I started getting into the MMA. I was really enjoying it. And, and I was looking at fighting MMA. Um, and that was when, if I remember the first MMA show that was licensed in Britain, Valley Tudo back then. Yeah. Um, and I managed to get down to watch that. So that, that, was, that was brilliant. 
Um, and that was what I was looking at. So I was like taking time out. After the loss in Germany at the European title, nobody likes saying it, but I was robbed. <laughs> <laughs> you never get over it. Um, but that, that kind of knocked me duck a little bit. I, I won it, defended it, and then lost it. And, and I didn't have to go to Germany to defend it, to be fair. I mean, I was told I'd, I'd won it and I defended it. You know, we could refuse it and then they'd have to come over here, but me being a dickhead, early 20s. <laughs> no, we'll go for it. <laughs> um, but you know, we got wrong. Who was that against? Um, Andre Remelt, I think his name was. He must have been about six foot 14. He was massive. Of what um, weight? 72, 71.8, 72, something like that, I think it was. I can't remember what his good weight was back then. But we got off the plane and the gym took them some weight, you know, weighing. That weight, weight doesn't matter. Another uh, weight doesn't matter. <laughs> and then we managed to sort of weigh in, and we both happened to weigh in on these dodgy scales that are exactly the same. And he was like about three, four, five bigger than me. Right. So, yeah. But, um, and it was a good fight, got it on video. I think I dropped him twice. Um, and still didn't get the decision over there. Still didn't get the decision now. It's what it is. It is what it is. I think back in the day as well, again, because there was no YouTube or live feeds, they could get away with robbing you and, and no one gets to hear about it. Yeah, it was a bad weekend. But I think I lost 600 pounds out of the person like bars as well. <laughs> it was a wrong weekend. <laughs> so you get offered a world title fight against Fran. Fran. Yeah. Now, was Fran champion at the time or was it vacant? Do you know what? I don't know. Okay. I think it might have been vacant. I think it might have been vacant. What did you think of Fran at the time as a fighter? It annoyed me because I'd had an interview when I, when I, I think when I was a European champion, I think, an in interview in Fighters Magazine or Combat, and they asked me what up and coming fighters do you see coming through that are going to do well? And I said, Fran. So I yeah. cursed myself. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Fran, yes, yeah, Fr Fran and Harvey Harrod. So they're and through. Fran was like a golden boy when he was unbeaten. He'd done similar to what yourself. I, I don't think he'd had as many defences. But I think he'd won area yeah, in England. Yeah, he did. He did. Well. He got a really good pedigree, um, and he come from a karate, sort of martial arts, yeah. traditional background. And I think I said this before: he's he transitioned really well. Yeah. Because normally they suffer with the boxing, they suffer with the hands or the movement uh, when they move to full contact from taekwondo, karate, whatever. But he didn't. Yeah. yeah he transitioned really well. So yeah. going into that fight, were you confident that your pedigree? Yeah. Yeah, I was confident because at the time, um, that's a word that sound like a dickhead. Um, I didn't see myself as above him, mm -hmm. but I saw myself as more experienced than him. I was younger than him, but I was more experienced than him. So in my eye, I mean, I wasn't, you never go into a fight to lose anyway. But I was confident, I was confident I could win. And what happened? I did win, he stopped me. Um, body yeah, shot? He stopped me, he did. Body shot set it up, and I think there was an uppercut in there as well. Um, yeah, he, he cloaked, I was taller than him. Um, and he closed that distance brilliantly. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah. When he when he banged, he banged. And when he got hit, he stayed there. Yeah. He, he just closed the distance really well. I, th I think at the time I was there watching it live that night, and I think at the time everyone considered it to be an upset. But I was when, upset. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely upset. <laughs> but when you look back at it and you look at what Fran did after that, yeah. yeah. You know, Fran was cut from it. Crazy cloth as well. He's yeah. very, very good fighter. Yeah. Well, a legend of the sport, Frank. For me. Of course, he is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, he, did, he deserved it one hundred percent. But that, that, that sort of, that did me. I did. Did <laughs> Did you feel like that? That was the end of the road. I, I didn't think I was going to get another shot. Um, yeah, that did me. Uh, and he went from strength to strength from that. Um, and I think I took a bit of a sabbatical at that point. Um, like I, said, I was playing back with MMA. I was quite enjoying that. I was still, still doing the full contact, you know, still doing the tie box. I've always, always been ticking along with something. But um, yeah, I think, I think I'd have a break after that. So, world title fight number two. Now, this is crazy. This is like this, one, one of my main reasons for wanting to do this interview with you today is to bring this story to light because I was part of this story myself. I remember speaking to Paul Hennessy from ISK. I think we had Kaz fighting on the card and I was speaking to Paul Hennessy and there was a card, was it Wolverhampton? Was it Wolverhampton? Yeah. Wolverhampton Civic Town Hall, Civic Hall. Yeah. And um, I was talking to him about the Italians that were coming over that night to fight uh, Brian Aston mm -hmm. for the super middleweight world title. The Wayne Turner. And well. Wayne Turner. And both of the Italians, one had failed the medical for Wayne Turner. Too much pasta. Too much pasta. 
and the other one for Brian had come in ridiculously overweight. So I'm too much pasta. <laughs> and I, yeah, one had found them, yeah, both were both too much pasta. So I had spoke to Paul Hennessy and I said, because you had just started training with me. Yeah. Uh, you'd probably, we were training for a fight and I think we were. It was the Irish kid. Yeah. There's one for you. On, on Les, was that the Leicester show? Yeah. Yes. So, I spoke to Paul Hennessy and Paul Hennessy had told me the situation with the Italians. And almost flippantly I said, oh, you should ask Dale. Because Dale's around that way. And then I phoned you. And I, I was said, in the beer garden, I'm a side. Where were you? I was in the beer garden, I was on the side watching the Grand National. <laughs> right, okay. Explain the situation to you. Well, uh, I was, I was on nights. I was going to the show, I was going to watch. Um, and the day before, I'm pretty sure it was the day, yeah it was, it was the day before, so it was the Saturday, because the fight was on the Sunday. It was the weigh-in day? Yeah, I went, I went on a session drink and a bit like that, because I, I got a night shift, I was actually working. So I was just having a quick side of watching the, uh, the racing. And then, uh, then you rung me, and sort of hinted that there might be an opportunity. So I jumped on it. Um, I, rang, I rang Paul up. Um, as a ruse just to confirm the tickets on the door sort of thing and then he started mentioning about the weighing and this that the other so I dropped it in I said I reckon I could make that weight in the morning and he said seriously I said yeah I reckon I could do that in the morning just strip it off and he said well the Italian's got till 10 o'clock tonight to weigh in and um, if he doesn't then it's open so ah, fair enough then so I went home I got changed on to work started work at 6 o'clock uh, 10 o'clock I get a phone call from Paul do you want it? I said, yeah, I'm on it. Right, I'll have it. Great. Wow. Um, so my boss sent me out. Uh, the next morning I got up. The girlfriend at the time um, was on holiday. So I had to pick up from the airport first thing in the morning. And uh, said, so, yeah, we're going to go and see Brian fight. It's changed slightly. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. um, so I went down. And yeah, that was it. I ended up fighting Brian. For the world title? For the world title, yeah. All right. So you've taken it the last minute. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a wing and a prayer. Yep. Relatively fit. Not, yeah, not, I'm not, not like, like, I weren't yeah. fight fit. Uh, definitely weren't fight fit, but um, I just the scrap on go. I was spotting bits of pops anyway, and we were building up to a fight. So I, was, I wasn't out of shape, but I wasn't fight fit. Did you have the belief that you could win that fight? Uh, I didn't care. I didn't care. I went in there, it's uh, the, the most dangerous person in the boxing ring, and he's an underdog. Yeah. And I love being an underdog. And, no end, of, you know, I've gone into the gym on a Thursday night and Doug said, you're fighting Sunday, yeah, fair enough, we'll do it. You know, after we'll fight, that attitude opens a lot of doors for you and, it, you know, it, 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 you learn more from fighting than you do from sparring, so I just whack in as many as you can get. So, I'd, I'd been the underdog on lots of occasions um, and thrived off it because you don't get nervous if you're underdog, you have nothing yeah. to lose. And, and that was it, that was a process when I fought. When I fought Fran, it was a big process to wind me up, get into the right mood, get in there, and go into the process. Fighting Brian, it was like, let's have a crack. And, and it was, I enjoyed them fights more. What than, did you know about Brian fights. going into it? Not a Brian for years. I mean, you know, we used to sit next to each other watching fights, you know, back in the old decade days when I, when I first started fighting. So I'd, I'd known Brian for years, and, and I always thought it was probably the weight above me, would we end up flying? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He'd not really been on my radar that much, because, and it was good. But I didn't think he was my weight. Yeah. So he was like weight, weight division above. Um, and he, he was he was really well in the weight division above. He was clean up in the weight division above. Um, but it's not on my radar because I didn't think, you know, until Can until can you remember fight. can you remember what Brian said when he knew that he was fighting you rather than the Italian? I suppose he was happy that he was that his world title yeah. fight had been because he, he was his first shot at the world title, so he was uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't remember the conversation. But, um, but I know he, I mean, we're good friends, me and Brian are good friends. Um, you know, we've spent you know, nights out together and what have you since. So we have discussed it quite a bit. And he, because um, I said to him, um, you know, you didn't have to have the rematch. I think it was out in Birmingham, jump one night. I said, you never have to have that rematch. And he says, he and did. He, and this is, he did. He, yeah, he kind of did, but now from, from his point of view, he could have been, he could have said All that. right, well, before we go on to the, talking about the rematch, okay. let's talk about the fight because this is why I think that he owed you a rematch. Because the nature of the fight and how the fight came about, you saved the day, you salvaged the day, but you fought a blinder that night. Favourite, I don't watch my fights, but if I'm gonna watch my fight, that's the one I watch. I love it, I don't have to watch the last round. 
Yeah. Dead accurate. I, I'm laughing your tits off watching that, it's brilliant. Um, but yeah, I just went to the talk. Talk through the fight. Nothing to lose. Uh, so I went out there with nothing to lose. Um, and it was it was a Boston fight until about round nine-ish. That's not really flagging. So when you when you you say it was a Boston fight until round nine, how did you how did you have it on the cards up and then? Because in my I, head, I was in your corner. In my, like, in my it head, couldn't have been any better. In my head, I was I was winning. I was stealing the rounds. I was winning. Uh, the, the scorecard said that after as well. Um, I'd got a good lead going into sort of eight and nine um, because I didn't have to fight for it. Mm -hmm. I just had to do what I could do so I could relax a lot more. The pressure was on Brian. Um, and I think it was ninth, tenth round or whatever I sat on the stool and I was saying to you, I was gassing, I was absolutely on my arse. And I remember saying to you, how many rounds are left? These three. I said, I ain't got three rounds in me. I said, I haven't got three And rounds. all you needed to do was stay on your feet? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose, but I, I just, I haven't got three rounds in me. Simple as that. See, we made an executive decision in the corner, didn't we? Yeah, let's have it. <laughs> let's have it. An amazing round. And I had it. Yeah, um, yeah so I went out and just, just bossed it three knockdowns. And it wasn't concussive. No, I don't know, you know, Brian can bang, but they weren't concussive knockdowns. They were, the tank was empty. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. I gave it everything I got. Um, and Brian beat me. Yeah, we, I, he just out, out, didn't we? Brian walked away with the world title that night, but I think like you kind of became the people's champion that night. I thought that's it. No, I think, I think like the, the heart, determination, the, the performance that you put on that night. People, I've always said this to any fighters, people pay good money for their tickets. And you know, they don't go to see people fall over, they go to see people fight. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get in the ring and give that, don't get in the ring. But you get that on a, on a day's notice as well. Look you wouldn't sell that fight. Um, I mean, I was there for the whole process and I have to say like the admiration that I had for you as a coach um, risen in that fight. Every single person that was in the audience that watched it that night like were, you could stand the innovation. It was absolutely brilliant and that's why I think if Brian didn't give you a rematch he would have always been thinking in his head how would I have feared against a fully prepared Dalwood? Mm. And, and, and Brian, and again, another fantastic fighter. I, I don't think that he would have been happy with his career if he didn't give you a rematch. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, there'd have been questions. There would have been questions. But he did. And, you know, he was absolutely gent for not even, you know, questioning it. I say that the conversation we had was, he said, he'd never got that shot if it were for me stepping in. Mm -hmm. So, he felt he owed, he owed the shot to me for my shot. And how long was sense. it after the first fight to the second fight? I can't remember, it was October, the, the, the third fight, the last, the last fight was October. So was it the same year, like, yeah, I think, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. May, I think it might have been May. I think it might have been May and October. And going into the rematch? Uh, Bearing in mind you've done so well on a day's notice. Brian's a dangerous fighter, he's tough, he's strong. And I knew mixing with him for 12 rounds wasn't gonna do me any favors. I just had to be fitter than him. Mm -hmm. Have a higher work rate than him. I mean, I think I was, it was over 300 kicks over 12 rounds. Yeah. The second time we met. Which, which, but they weren't damaging kicks. But they were keeping him off balance. Yeah. They were That's keeping him off. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's dangerous. You see if you watch the video, he's towards the end he starts, he starts really, Gunning for it. But I think desperation was setting in because you could clearly see, like you come back to the corner after every round, it was like another round in the bank, another round in the bank. But the difference between the rematch to the first fight is it was controlled and it was measured. Yeah. You know, you were putting them Took in the bank. Risk. Yeah. 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 So you're not, you wasn't, you, you said to me that you weren't happy with your performance that night. It's a boring fight to watch. No, I don't. I'd, I'd be old school, I'd scrap. Um, and I didn't have a scrap. But but it was a clever fight, and, and that's what wins. That's what wins belts. It's, you, you could have uh, football three points is three points. Don't, don't you think you had your fair share of scraps and like you, <sighs> that world title can never be taken off you. You know that's that's something that only a select few have got, and that was from fighting a clever fight. Mm. Yeah, no, no, you're damn right. Yeah, yeah. And, and if I did it again, I'd fight a safe fight. Obviously, mm -hmm. we knew what we needed to do. Your game plan was spot on. I just needed to fill my tank for it, which I did. Uh, as fit as I've ever been, because I knew that that was the key to it. 
that our game plan would only work if I was fit. Yeah. So it was the fittest I've ever been. Um, and it worked. It's just not my favourite way of fighting. Yeah, yeah. But like I say, if I went back, I'd do it again. Same, same way. So a unanimous points decision in the bank. Uh, an ISK World Super Middleweight title around your waist. How did that feel? Because after after like all those fights and all those years that you've invested, how did it feel to finally be a professional world champion? It's hard to explain. Yeah, just fantastic. Yeah, one of, one of the best feelings, one of the best feelings I've ever had. It was just like, you know, you, you pick a sport, you pick something you love, and then you get to be classed as, you know, at that point, number one in it. It's just, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard to explain. It's a bit surreal. I think it took a few days to sink in. To be honest, I mean, when I got drunk, it took a few days to hand over kicking. But um, yeah, it, it, it's fantastic. Just words can't really explain it. It's just, and and I don't know if I'm allowed to say this because um, you know you did say it to me in confidence, but you had uh, a kind of Rocky three moment with Brian after that, didn't you? You know, Rocky three where Apollo and, and Rocky. <laughs> Not quite to Rocky's level, but. Brian's a good lad, and like I say, you've known each other in sport for years anyway. And, and after that fight, he's, he's, you know, any fighter will tell you, you step in the ring with somebody and you fight somebody, you share some quite special. Yeah, yeah. And you, know, you, you get a bond. And um, yeah, I love Brian Tim Pierce. And I've been out drinking with him, he's been out drinking with me. I think New Year's Eve, we dressed up as I was half man, half woman, he was Fred Flintstone. But, it was, um, <laughs> you know, but he did come up to the gym, and we did spar again after. And, uh, and it was nice to have that conversation and spar. And have a bit of fun. It's like the first time we fought. Uh, he got rear front kick. He kept slipping in. I hated it. And obviously we drilled it. We drilled the defence against it. We built a lot around it. Then I fought him the second time. Never threw it. So when we sparred and came up, we had a chat, a laugh. I'm like, where was your front kick? So I didn't think it was. No, no, they were killing me. And <laughs> it's, it's nice to be able to share these things after. But, uh, yeah. Um, and who who won that spar? Because yeah. obviously, they don't every, every, they said everybody wants to know he won the first one, you won the second one, who won the last one? Give it a draw. <laughs> okay, who's the best fighter you ever fought? Fran's up there, because he took me by surprise. Didn't expect that. Um, uh, Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali? One of the toughest fights I ever had was Muhammad Ali. Okay, where French, was that? French Moroccan, Muhammad Sin Ali. Okay. Um, for the European, um, and I could barely walk or talk after it. it Win or loss that one? I won that one. Right. Um, I didn't think I had. Uh, and afterwards I were like, and I got given this, I hate hometown decisions. And it was my hometown and I got the decision. I thought I, I weren't happy. And I took the um, Steve Art referee, pulled him to one side after. I said, was that, was that right? He says, yeah, he's watched the video back, that's right. And then I went out, I felt awful, and just, I didn't enjoy celebrating it. Yeah. And that was when I won the European. I didn't enjoy celebrating it, because I thought, um, I thought I'd robbed him. And then I watched the video back, then I celebrated. Yeah. Yeah, then I know what him. But I think that's the thing, isn't it? You, you walk out of a hard, hard fight, and especially when you're critical, and you're feeling like you've just been mugged. You know, yeah, that's, yeah. that's what you remember. Yeah, I, was, I had to drink through straws, it was just horrendous. Jeez. And, and would you say that was your hardest fight? Um, that was a, like him or Fran, your yeah, best, his, his best kicks, fight? Um, cleverest was, was, was Fran in that fight. Uh, hardest was probably, um, yeah, the French kick. He, he just, I think he'd got a tie background as well. He kicked like a mule. Um, and we started off like, you know, I was like, checking at my legs, checking at my arms. And then in the end, towards the end of the fight, I was just moving. And just like, there, there wasn't a limb that didn't hurt. How many rounds was that? 12. Was that 12 round? Yeah. Wow. Okay, an interesting one for you now, Dad. What was the highest high of your career? And what was the lowest low? Lowest low. Lowest high. Uh, lowest retiring low. Yeah, because I wish I'd have defended it. Um, Were you feeling that at the time, or was that something that sunk in after? It was just, I was running, you know, I, was, I was part running a gym, um, and I had to obviously take a step back to train for the fight and when I came back into the, the gym didn't feel the same, I didn't want to go through that again. There was a lot, I was getting bad advice from people around me at the time, you know, um, now you've won it, you know, retire world champion, leave it at that. And so I did. Um, so yeah, the, the, the one regret I've got, I won't say I was really low, low I suppose, but yeah, it was a regret that I didn't, I didn't defend it, it didn't feel good. Like you know when you retire, it's yeah. relaxing sort of. Yeah, yeah. It didn't. 
um, and I just turned 30, so I felt old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's I'm just young, but I felt old because I just turned 30. You, you, there's 30 year olds that have had like 20 fights and oh, 30 yeah, yeah, year olds yeah. that have had 60 fights. Oh, yeah, I'm 43 and I look like a 30 thing, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you listen to your body at the time? My timetable and my love of teaching. I love teaching, I love coaching. And you know, I've got fighters under me and I've got students under me. And, um, and yeah, I had to step back from that. And, when I, and, and it, I don't think it was until I stepped back into it again, it was just it was different. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't want to go through it again in case it was even more different when I come back. So. And the highest high? The world title's got to be there, hasn't it? That has definitely got to be there. Um, one of the highest highs was actually as a coach. And that was my brother's English title. I think right. it was one of the most exciting, lifting fights I've ever been a part of. It was ridiculous. Um, it was for the English title in Leicester um, against Curtis Valentine. Okay. Big, big hitter. Um, they called him the Mini Tyson. Uh, he went in pro boxing, I think, after that. Um, and he was dangerous. Um, but Ricky's, I'll say Ricky's, Ricky's tank, fuel tank was just phenomenal. I'd go running with him for a fight and I'd be knocking out, you know, three, four, five miles and peeling off for a 12 round fight and he'd be doing a three round fight and he'd carry on and do another three, four miles. It was just, it was nuts. Jeez. Um, he did his first marathon not so long ago, smashed under three hours. First marathon was just, just nuts. And that's, wow. that's like nearly 40 years old. Um, but yeah, his, his fitness was ridiculous. And he got in there and he fought the first round and he got absolutely bang silly. And he got dropped at the end of that round. Um, well, that's when I shot him out of the audience. He just dropped and Bell saved him and he sat down and literally, like, what day is it? I think he got the question right. You're good, we're good, <laughs> right. So we cracked on. I said, move, just move. And then it was the most epic four rounds I think we've ever seen. And the, the arms were ready to go up. The crowd were going absolutely nuts. It was just typical Rocky fight. It was just yeah. fantastic. This guy was just dangerous and Ricky was fit and tough. And Ricky took it and beat him. And, uh, yeah. was, was that hard, like <clears throat> working the corner of a sibling? Yeah, yeah, it was. Because you've worked hundreds and hundreds of corners over over the years. Yeah, first his first ever fight. I think he got knocked out first ever fight. But see, seeing him, seeing him get uh, took some getting used to. Um, and Harvey Harris, Harvey Harris stopped him. Yeah. Um, and they just went at it hell for leather, and we literally saw them. One of them's gonna go, and then Harvey's leg connected, and down he went. I think some dickhead up from road jump to say, hey, Rose, stay down. Oh dear. Uh, you don't say that there's always eye. There's always yeah, one. You don't say that now, brother's back when he's unconscious on the floor. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was hard, but kind of got used to it. So a bit of a camaraderie going in, you go, well, never get used to brother getting hit, but you might. Yeah, yeah. And how, how, how far did Ricky go in his career? Pro English, yeah, pro English time. Well. And then he got, um, Ricky's quite straight down the line, and the politics of the sport then. Put him off, and that's that's when he finished. I think he might have a comeback and had a, a comeback fight, but yeah, the politics just span his head, and he and he left it. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. It was bad as well. He got his basically got his title taken off him because he fell out. Right, and then because it was a draw, they offered to give it him back. Right, okay, yeah, that did it. That did it. Yeah, and yeah I get it. only in kickboxing, huh? Yeah, I get it. I completely get it. So you and Ricky fought. Were there any other family members that were interested in fighting? Was it like in the family blood? Um. I don't mind the blood, I mean there are four of us, so if one of us gets heavily into something, there's a chance one, one, you know, one of the others is, and it, it was Ricky. Um, through the family, there's a little bit of fighting history on my mum's side, um, there's two uncles, um, I mean, they, they fought for reputation more than anything, um, but it was more spit, sawdust and a bales as opposed to boxing rings and gloves. Right. Um, but I, I don't think that fed through. Um, I think if anything, I think my dad was a big boxing fan, um, and I remember the videos that he used to show us the old, you know, the, the great everywhere's the alleys and the foremans and the like. Right. The like saying, there's one video with them all on. I remember that clear as day. Champions forever, probably. That is the one. That is the one, yeah. Yeah. Um, which you'll definitely have, obviously. Um, and he, he, you know, he, he did the proper fatherly thing and introduced us to Rocky, as you do. Real uh, boxing. Real boxing, yeah. So there's a whole Rocky thing in there. And I mean, he was a big boxing fan right through till I think probably 90s, you know, Eubank then was probably his last real interest in boxing. It boxing changed, didn't it, around that kind of era? Two belts, yeah. that's true. Yeah, I, I think it, it, because it got watered down, my dad lost a little bit of uh, faith in it, really. 
So uh, I think he still enjoys a good fight, but um, but yeah, he, he was a boxing fan back in the day, and that, that got my interest. And did he always come to your fights? Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, most of them. Not all of them, not every single one. But um, yeah, yeah, he'd come and watch it, enjoy it. Um, he didn't actually want me to do kickboxing now at the beginning, and and elite. Yeah, because obviously my, my dad didn't, you know, fully understand what kickboxing was back then. Anyway, we're talking nearly 30 years ago, and he'd got a mate at work that did loud bar kung fu. Right. So his mate at work, you know, what martial artists are like my martial arts is the best. Yeah. So he'd obviously advised my dad that he don't want to go down kickboxing where he wants to do a true martial art like loud bar. So my dad. Um, not advised me, just suggested, I suppose, that you know, his mate does well, but I don't want to have a crack down there instead, sort of thing. And uh, my dad comes out with some good stuff, but I'm glad that's one thing I didn't listen to. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, going back to the real Rocky, so if you had to liken yourself to one of the Rocky characters, it'd have to be Rocky, wouldn't it? Mick Crosland has done this. We, we've had this conversation before. Um, yeah, but I'm not a sad boy, so. True. But you did. You didn't mind getting hit. Uh, it gives you a buzz to a degree. Um, no, I, I didn't mind that. So it's like sparring with lads in the gym now. If I had to keep one element of training, you know, if I had a choice, bag work, pad work, but I'd keep sparring. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's enough as a as a light to because I'm trying to get around some injuries. But um, but I love sparring. You know, even if I'm unfit, I'll, I'll jump in and have a spar. And it's like you know, we, we can have someone new come to the gym, just come up for some sparring, like you know. Kazim's been up, and like when Kazim came up, I was well out of shape. I'd not sparred for ages. I was avoiding sparring because I was trying to get injuries sore. Yeah, yeah. But Kazim was coming up, so I got me sparring again. Yeah, enjoying it. Yeah, probably the worst session to come back and spar. But Kazim's up. It's just one of those oh, things gosh. where you can't help yourself. Yeah, no, it's, it's that competitive edge. You know, I'll be 65, 70, 80, whatever. If I make it that far, I still have that competitive edge. Mm, definitely. Awesome. So yeah. down with the champion, but. Another side of you is down with the instructor, the coach. Um, tell us a little bit about your coaching journey. Um, obviously, I started teaching my own class, syllabus of the class, when I was 18. Um, and I just loved it. I love teaching you know, martial arts, anything. I mean, I work with kids now on a professional basis, and, and I, love, I love that. I love, I love any, any, any sort of you know, teaching, coaching, whatever it is. Love it. Um, so, yeah, I started doing something when I was 18, first class. Um, I think I put my first fighter out when I was 19, 20, something like that. Um, and I just love coaching. And obviously it was full contact back then. Um, and then I started switching up a little bit. And now it's, as I say, it's basically K1. Um, but I shut my gym down four years ago. About four years ago. When I had a full-time gym, I shut that down four years ago. It's lost my mojo a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, Carl Johnson had come through, got pro, pro world title. Um, that was like an end of an era with him, and I think to be fair, Carl kept me in the sport coaching. Yeah, me. yeah. Um, and then when he won the world title, and then um, it, we moved him up to um, Mick Crosland to have his last couple of fights there because he needed a bigger gym. So I've never had a you know, full time gym like Mick and yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's your full time career. I've always had a job alongside him. Um, so it's been more, you know, it's been smaller fighters' gyms as opposed yeah. to your bigger gyms. And Mick had got K1 lads that would push him on a regular basis in sparring rather than just having to travel around and you know Carl needed that, Carl definitely needed that. Uh, how, how did it feel in comparison obviously you won your pro world title and then Carl won his pro world title, how did it feel in comparison? It was great, that was good, I thought it was great. <laughs> nah, there was a buzz, there was a buzz, it was um, I think if if we'd have had that conversation about Carl moving off to another gym, greener pastures before he got the world title, yeah, I think it probably would have been a different conversation. Um, you would have thought it would have changed a little it, bit. It, maybe. it wouldn't. It, it, yeah. It's like the, the way I saw it, I'd, in my career, I got a professional world title and then I coached the professional world title. So it was like it really was the end of an era. It was when we celebrated and everything else and it was exciting, but it was more a bit of a relief than yeah. anything. Yeah. It was, it, it was a, a nicer feeling. Yeah, a nicer feeling, but not a better feeling, if that makes sense. Yeah. Than winning it. And winning it is, is a higher up there, but getting somebody else to it is. is yeah, it's pretty happy. And would you say like you're like at coaching, fighting, everything in between, would you say winning your world title is the proudest point of your career? Do you know what one of the proudest is? I won a medal for the Derbyshire Dales uh, Performance Coach of the Year. Right. And it's, it sounds really, I'm like dead chuffed with that. 
When was this? I'll tell you when it was. In fact, it looked really good because I was in Italy at the time, my England team, so I didn't want to catch it. <laughs> um, it was, they had like local awards around Matlock and Derby Dales. And um, it was when we were in Italy mm-hmm. with, the, with the England team. So we're talking you know, some years ago, like, Two, 12, 13 years ago. Thing. Yeah, something like that. Um, and I got that. Obviously, I couldn't be there because I was in, so my mum went and picked it up for me instead. But uh, but they had to say, you know, you, you can't be here to pick it up because it's in a slip of the England team. It's right, like, really good. <laughs> yeah. But that, it sounds really, really like a small sort of thing, but I've still got it home. All my trophies, all my trophies went in a skip when I shut the gym down four years ago. I just skipped right. Back, kept my belts, trophies just with big plastic and marble. Then give a couple out to kids and swipe the rest. But I kept that. It's a little glass thing, looks dead nice. Um, yeah, it's just because it, it was local to me. I mean, yeah. I, I don't live in Matlock now, but I love Matlock. Derby Shadales, I love it. So for for the people around you to vote you for it, yeah, yeah, you've not been out there and tech it. You've, you've that one nice. Yeah, well, you, you, I think the thing with you, Dale, is like you've never been an ego man. You know, you've never built your career. Of it. Which is like anyone that knows you knows that you're unassuming. You quite happy to go under the radar. You don't like to be praised. Um, even though praise is due. Um, so I think something like that that was out of your hands and not orchestrated by yourself and it's just like, listen, this is what we kind think you nowhere. deserve. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I think that's, that's fair dues. Um, and I think like one of the reasons that I wanted to do these kickboxing life stories is giving credit where credit's due. You know, a, a lot of people like me and you have been friends for many, many years and kind of like I know your backstory. A lot of people don't. And I think it's right that the pioneers of the sport like get a chance to tell their story. Because the thing is, you can get, you can get famous in the kickboxing world these days, like self-fame and self-promotion and Excuse social me. media and whatnot. Jake Paul. Yeah, well, yeah, even worse than Jake Paul, because yeah. at least Jake Paul is out there doing yeah. something. Yeah, true. But, um, you know, I think it's I think it's important that people realise that there was something before that. You know, yeah, um, right outside the ring, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So since retiring from fighting, um, what would you say was your biggest regret of your fighting career? I mean, you did say not defending your world title. Were there any other regrets? That what looks like it looks like a pretty full career and a complete not career. Not having an Okay. Not having an MMA fight, because I mean, I boxed, kickboxed, low kick, K1, uh, it was more time, low kick, but um, yeah, I, I never I never had an MMA fight. Um, and I would love to even just, just to tick that off. Do you, you, uh, what's your ground game like? Now, rubbish, absolutely <laughs> rubbish. Back in the day, when I, when I started MMA, um, it was about a rear naked choke and an armbar, it was pretty much the limit. Yeah. Um, and it was like I said, with Valichudo back, back then, um, it was really basic, really basic. And a lot of the gyms, to be fair, were training for self-defense and then sort of moved over to the competition. It's nowhere near as advanced as it is now. Um, and I did it for probably a couple of years and then got back into full contact. So a couple of years in the early 20s. Um, I just started working on the door when I was 19, so it would have been from 19 till 21-ish, something like that. That was about when I started doing it. Um, but then the, the, the Fran fight actually pulled me back out of it. Right. And gave me a different focus. Uh, and got me back into the striking. But I mean, the gym I'm coaching at now, I've been doing for the last two or three years, um, is a BJJ gym, it's an MMA gym. Uh, I do the striking. A uh, good friend of mine, Lee Baum, he does the BJJ, um, and he's top of his game. He's he under Alliance in Brazil, and he's second degree, second degree black belt in BJJ. So he's one of the first, you know, he's one of the early black belts in Britain, which is, you know, you get these seventh, eighth, and black belts yeah. all over the place, they mean nothing. Yeah. BJJ, well, it depends. It depends on the club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, BJJ, if it's BJJ black belt, it tends to mean something. Yeah. And a second degree BJJ, you know, that's something else. Yeah. And so I've been there three years. He's a good mate of mine. We had a conversation in, in the Isle of Man. We took motorbikes to the Isle of Man over a beer. I was losing my mojo, shooting the gym down. And he offered me to come in as a striking coach. I went really feeling it. And then I thought about it. And I went back and got my mojo back. Just loved it. Absolutely back on it now. Yeah, I've got to thank Lee for that. Um, and have you ever you have you ever had like an inkling to, to one more just an MMA just one more? <laughs> no, them boys are they're good. Yeah, I actually yeah. had this because I said to Lee, I said, oh, for three years I've been saying I'm gonna have to roll with you. I have to have a roll. Lee's the wrong person to say let's have a roll. Yeah. I said oh, yeah, I'm gonna have to have a roll. I said yeah yeah okay. So me and him just went in the gym and uh, he said um, he 
he says, right, that's Rob, what we do then? He says, right, just, just roll, just see what you got. Okay, so we did three minutes. And I thought I'd die. <laughs> I don't see what I'd die. <laughs> At one point, before I went, because my mission was our stubborn arm, before I went, she went, you will tap, won't you? I'm not stupid, of course I'm going to tap. And at one point, it got me in this weird position, like a corner of suture or something. And I'm like there thinking, it's getting very comfy, this. Did you yeah. have a little devil dial on your shoulder going, don't tap, don't tap? Oh, that's stupid. And I was and like, the little angel on this side saying, I need those No, because I've heard if you don't tap, you wet yourself. Yeah, right, nice. okay. Anyway, so I'm laying there and I'm thinking, everything's going fuzzy. But it not got me in a choke. Right. It was arms, it not got me in a choke. And I, my brain couldn't compute why I was falling unconscious, but it not got me in a choke. <laughs> and I had to tap, I had to tap in the end. And then we carried on, I, I tapped a few times over three minutes. Um, but I'd got no finishing moves, do you know what I mean? I, yeah, I, I knew yeah, the basics yeah, yeah. of moving around, I'd got no finishing moves. I suppose if you were gonna compete, you would have explored. Yeah, cause, yeah, and, I, yeah. and there'd be no better gym to do it than, than with Alliance. So yeah, I'd, I'd be bang on. But I mean, I, afterwards he said, he, he said, <laughs> he, he says, you're better than I thought you'd be. You must right. have a really crap. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I knew where to be, the placements and what have you. It's obviously yeah. you know, the bits there, but it was kind of, I'd get to something and I'm like, now what do I do? Yeah, so, yeah. It's just, it's, the game has come on, you know, 20 years, MMA's just flown. It's come on so scares much. me, MMA yeah. scares me. So since retiring from fighting, outside of martial arts, mm -hmm. what do you do with your time? What, work-wise or social? Just, yeah, just everything. So work-wise, I work for the Derbyshire Youth Offender Team, um, substance misuse. So we work with kids that, um, that come to us on orders, uh, rather than go to court, they, they admit to it and they can come to us. Uh, they have to go through a panel first, but then come to us. And we put one various orders from three months through. And then they get caseworkers, and the caseworker works with them, looks into social background, the criminal background, and basically put things in place that um, will not criminalise them, that's his main thing, um, and see what they need to not offend in the future. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I started as, uh, and I do substance misuse. So I'm now a bolt on professional that gets called in um, to work with them with substance misuse. How rewarding is that now? Frustrating sometimes, but yeah, right. no, it can be, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's worth it. And, that, and outside of work? Shoot a lot. I like shoot guns. things. I like guns. Uh, yeah, it used to be guns and motorbikes. I sold my bike now, but um, yeah, I, I love shooting. Always did, you know, since 12, 13 years old, I've been shooting. But now, yeah, now I've never more time and me hours How often do you do that? Um, at least once a week. We play shoot at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. Um, I mean, we did have a weekend away. Um, and then we like shot all weekend. It's, it's, I love it. It's great. Clay, clay shooting at the minute. I mean, I've target game all sorts, but passion's clay shooting. I love it. Well, so it's, it's a break from the gym. I mean, like Lee. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lee teaches at uh, Alliance, and then Matt, Matt Uber, one of the other coaches. Um, we all shoot. We all shoot together. And it's nice to have the crack away from the gym. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's nice. I see a lot of like uh, you guest instruct. You bring a lot of guest instructors and fighters yeah, down. Yeah, to the uh, Sean Quinn's been up. Uh, RBR, he's into it now. He, he's got his own good license. He, he does a bit. Yeah, it's good. It's good because it, it's still competitive but fun. Yeah. Um, it's guns. It's yeah, guns, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> still a mean? big kid, aren't you? Yeah. So yeah. plans for the future? Um, keep coaching. Um, I'm enjoying working with the MMA fight, still doing K1 stuff. So I'm fight really out disappointed there. that you just didn't say uh, come back. <laughs> There's no come back no in this. There is in my head, I'd love to, I'd love to fight again. Um, if I was injury free and I walked into a show and they said, yeah, I'd jump in. Yeah. I'd jump in, I'd love it. You stand a better, ch you stand a better chance of getting me to make a comeback if you ask me the night before. If, yeah. you give, if you give me time to prep, it's not going to happen. Yeah, Too yeah, many yeah. injuries. So outside of the comeback? for the future? Still coaching, yeah, still coaching. Uh, I see the, the MMA guys that um, I'm helping do the striking with now, because um, you're constantly learning, um, constantly learning, and it's a new style. So obviously I teach K1, my sessions are K1, but if we've got a lad that a lot of them cross train between the BJJ, the MMA, and the striking, um, and if they've got an MMA fight coming up, then obviously the coaching slightly changes, the footwork changes, the techniques change. Uh, so I'm on a learning curve with that as well. Um, but you know, as I was told once, if you know, no matter what style it is, if you understand fighting, you understand fighting. Yeah. So it's you know, it's, it's that's there, so, and it's interesting because it's getting me back around the MMA side of it. Would you would you say you're a better coach or a better fighter? Ooh. Ooh. Um. 
what do I enjoy the most? Or am I... No, which, which did you excel at? I mean, you excelled at both, but which do you feel like? I fight, yeah, probably fighting, because uh, I was more selfish. Okay. I'm relying on somebody, I'm relying on somebody else when I'm coaching. So when I was fighting, it was easy, because I had to be selfish. Yeah. And, and that, was, that was guaranteed, that's what I did, because that's what was needed. As a coach, um, I'm confident in my coaching ability. Um, but I think if I was to critique my coaching, I'm probably a little too basic. I think I love a Calzaghi. Mm -hmm. I love a, a proper man, a fighter, a, fight, a fighter's fighter. Um, a, a lot of what I teach is, is basic. You've got to be fit, well-conditioned fighters. But they might not be the, the flashiest, you know, they might not be spinning many kicks in or whatever, but there's a lot of clever, clever bits going on in there. But outside of the physicality of fighting, like the, the mindset that you, you, you install in your fighters. That's massive, the mindset's massive. And I think, I think like with the career that you've had and the experience that you've had, that, like, that kind of like outweighs you spin kicks and you know flashy kicks here and there. Just head the fist. Just head the fist. You'll be yeah. Right. yeah, 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 yeah. The mentality is massive. Yeah, you, you, yeah, hundred um, percent. The gym's good for that as well. You know, uh, we get a lot of people come through the gym with PTSD stuff like that. Okay. And, and the, the, the mindset is massive. Yeah, it, it's it's it does a lot of good a lot of good for people. Um, and you get to hit people. Yeah, that's always a bonus. Yeah. So, I always like to ask this question. If there was one bit of advice that you could give a young fighter coming through now that's got all of this in front of him, um, coming from a place of experience has pretty much been there and done that on every level, what bit of advice could you give somebody if they had aspirations for reaching the top? Leave your weekends free because you want to be fine as often as possible. You get a fight, take it. Don't worry about losing, just take it. Just keep busy and fight. What, what you pick up from three rounds, early, early days three round fights, what you pick up for three rounds in the ring is weeks and weeks and weeks of training in the gym. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's just get in there. Spar loads, obviously, uh, but just fight. If you get offered a fight, don't weigh it up too much, just take it. Simple as that. And, and that, that opens doors as well. Promoters love that, they see that. They, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it's not a big money sport, so do whatever you can to get your foot in the door. Um, you know, it's like if I didn't jump in with Ryan at the last minute, I wouldn't have got the world title shot. I'd have probably finished the European champion. And it's, yeah, and it's yeah. do you know what I mean? It, it's things like that. You help a promoter out, they like, it's a hard game promoting. So if you help a promoter out as a fighter, they'll look after you. And fortune favours a brave. This is it, yeah. yeah. So wrapping things up there, anyone you'd like to give a shout out to and, uh, or any thank yous to? Too many. <laughs> too many. Too, I've been blessed. I've had a blessed career with people that have helped me. I really have. Um, yourself, full contact side. Yeah, yourself, you give me everything. Not charge me a penny and give me everything. Um, um, as a coach as well, I've learned a lot from you as a coach in the corner. Because when, when I fought under you and I came back to the corner, it, it didn't matter what happened, I was going to have a different fight. And you, and you see that with a lot of fights. You, you, you can see the standard of the gym when they come out after a bad round. Yeah. Um, and you, they come out with confidence. Uh, so I learned a lot from you for that. So yeah, obviously yourself. Um, Richard Smith, easily, I, I say, you know, the best Thai boxing coach in Britain, if not, you know, you know he's up there in the world. He's, he's, he's fantastic. Um, I don't, don't see much of him now, but you know, I class him as a good mate. Brilliant. Did a lot for me. You know, taking a full contact fight with Charles. And, into the tire boxing gym, that's dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, Richard Smith, Dougie Harrison for getting me started in it in the first place. Um, but just everybody, really. You know, my mum, my dad. Um, ev yeah, everybody. It's, it's just been fantastic. Um, obviously, Jane for giving me a lifestyle that makes me realise I don't need to fight. Yeah. And I'm not in the same shape to fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It feeds me way too much. Um, yeah, I've, I've got a good life. I've got a good life and I've been blessed right through 30, 30 years of my career. Um, I've not had many fallouts. Um, I've got some good, really good friends. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to sit and name loads because I'll miss out, but I've got to name you know, the main three coaches. Yourself, Richard and uh, Doug. Well, I'm sure, like, I can only speak for myself, but I'm sure the other two are exactly, it's been a pleasure, Dale, like you're, um, you're sort of the earth and, you, you know, top draw. 
type drop and it wouldn't be right just before I let you go um, I know nobody likes to talk about charity work that they've done but you are, you, you're highly invested in a charity at the moment aren't you? Yeah it, it, it slowed down obviously locked down everything else we've not been in contact for a bit but um, yeah mental health charity uh, doing rural counselling uh, the fantastic it's like I was a typical you know we've got about 13 years to when I, when I retired at 30 um, 29, 30 um, I, I put myself through counselling not because I retired it wasn't that bad but I put myself through I felt I needed to go through counselling and I did, and I went with doing rural counselling in the charity based, and it blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. I couldn't thank them enough. Um, they were fantastic, and the, the the guy that runs it, I uh, kept in touch with him, uh, and I, I felt that I needed to give something back. Is that a man, men's mental health, or is that a general no, general, general mental? Yeah, health? it's general, but but it, it, it's a good point that is. Um, so I thought I needed to give some back. That's when we did 100 rounds sparring, but, mm -hmm. and we did that for charity and then raised some money for them for that. And we kept in touch. And the nice thing was, um, because we kept in touch, I got to go into the office and have a conversation um, with the guy that runs it. And um, and I said, "You're missing a trick. What do you do for advertising?" I said, "Because you're, you're, you're the biggest area that you're missing out on is people like me, mm -hmm. alpha males in gyms. Yeah, don't talk. yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't of talk. course, of course. They punch stuff. They don't yeah. talk. And that's where you're missing out. You know, I'd." I'd, I'd for years, I'd, I'd been that, that guy that didn't talk. Um, and it wasn't until I realised that's what I needed it that I did. And then when I did, brilliant. Um, I see Miss Atman. So we designed a poster. Uh, I put a poster together for them and they got it checked out, the legal thing and what have you, because the logos and what have you. Mm -hmm. And it was designed specifically for adult males, or males, in the alpha male sort of gym. The, right. The, the main picture was a guy in a stool in the, in the corner of the boxing ring, hood up and what have you. And it's like, who's in your corner? Blah, blah, blah. And um, <clears throat> I managed to get it in, I think it's about 200, 250 gyms in Britain. Um, and they, they went out different martial arts gyms, weights gyms, boxing gyms, and got, got them out there. Um, and then two of my instructors were starting up a gy um, syllabus sort of class in mm -hmm. that lock. And um, the charity then turned around and they paid for their um, public indemnity licenses. Well, wow. for a bit, yeah, obviously. The coverage themselves did really well. But yeah, mental health, it's. it's it's massive, you know, people don't, you know, they all, it's good to talk. It yeah, really is, yeah. it really is good to talk. And that is, it's the simplest thing to do, talk. I think now, like, you know, the last couple of years, especially with everything COVID related and lifestyle change. Yeah, massive, massive. But it is becoming a bigger, you know, a bigger thing now. It's not a stigma anymore. No, that, yeah, that's yeah. a big, yeah, it's not a stigma. And it is good to talk. And there's a lot more people out there aware of it, and more, you know, foundations and, and groups that, that are, building up now and it's, it's good it's important mm. yeah because it's real good stuff listen Dale it's been a pleasure uh, if anybody needs to find Dale you find him on Facebook are you on Instagram yeah well, Jess is Jim yeah. on there yeah. Yeah. Barely going now, but you better. know Dale's always there uh, to give advice to any of the younger fighters coming through or or, or anyone for that matter, matter. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure Dale thank you very much my man yeah, absolute pleasure mate. excellent <laughs>